Hello, everybody. This is Ask the Doctor. This is your chance to get quality medical advice by just tweeting your questions. Tweet your questions to at Editorji or on Twitter India or to me, and we will be taking your questions and we are putting them to the top doctors in the country. Uh, we've been doing many of these episodes in the past. If you want to watch one of the earlier episodes on issues ranging from mental health to child to vaccination to testing to treatment, you can download the Editorji app at editorji.com slash download. You'll be able to get it. But today, Today, we are privileged to have two of the leading doctors in the country who are joining us. Dr. Prateet Samdani, joining us from Breach Candy, is a COVID internal medicine and intensivist. I have to tell you, Dr. Samdani, I've been hearing about you for weeks, if not months, as a legend in the field. And a lot of people have been telling me that if you really want to understand anything about COVID, Dr. Sandani is the person you have to get on your program and just talk to him. So it's a real privilege and a pleasure to have you joining us. And for all of you to get a chance to tweet your questions and to have Dr. Sandani and Dr. Sachin answering them is, is, a, is a privilege for you because Dr. S uh, Dr. Sachin is interventional pulmonology at the at, and critical care and sleep medicine at the Manipal Hospital in, in Bangalore. So it's great to have you joining us, uh, Dr. Dr. Sachin, as well. And I think one of the reasons it's really great to have both of you together joining us is that I think Dr. Samdani has been at ground zero for a while, right? Uh, Maharashtra has been the worst affected state since the second wave started. And Mumbai has been one of the centers of it, along with Pune and Nagpur, so that's been ground zero. Then ground zero started to move a little bit to Delhi, and Delhi has been in a bit of a crisis. Now, maybe, we hope, starting to stabilize, as is Mumbai. But the next epicenter looks as if it could be in cities like Bengaluru and other places. Cases are now rising very fast in Karnataka and Bengaluru. So, actually, I'm going to just start by seeing if there's some advice, um, Dr. Dr. Samdani, that you may have for Dr. Sachin and others. What is the lesson that Mumbai learned, which other cities that may now become hotspots might some any advice for them? Uh, Dr. Samdani, oops, he dropped off just as that minute rest when you when you want to trust. So anyway, let me when Bali comes back, Dr. Sachin. Let me ask you, how bad is the situation in Bengaluru? Am I right in saying that it could be the next hotspot? Or it's already is the next hotspot? I think it is uh, already a next hotspot, Vikram, because what we are seeing in Bangalore is uh, I don't want to call it as a wave. I think it's like a tsunami or an apocalypse because a lot of cases are increasing, a lot of shortage of the bed, medicines, vaccines, the same thing that was there in Mumbai and Delhi a couple of weeks ago has even started to touch the Bangalore and parts of Karnataka as well now. So why this is happening when we look into the matter, even though a strict curfew has been imposed in Karnataka, it is not being effective. We can see everywhere the people are moving around, people are giving false excuses to go around their homes. And I can see when I go around the city, the traffic is as usual as it was before the strict curfew has been imposed. So I think a strict lockdown is the need of the hour in the situation this is what I think is the lesson we have already learned from the neighboring states like Maharashtra or Delhi. So the strict lockdown is the only solution to put a pause or a break to the speaking of the COVID-19 wave. Okay, Dr. Sandani is back with us. Dr. Sandani, what, what I was asking you was, what are the lessons that you think Mumbai and Maharashtra can teach to other cities and, and other states? What are the lessons you've learned? Uh, Dr. Sandani, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I'm and, just uh, asking you, what are the... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So let me let me just start. We did know that Mumbai and Maharashtra just has probably just peaked off. At least Mumbai has just peaked off. The lessons that the rest of the country can learn. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. So the, the the lessons that the rest of the country can learn is to go down into phasic lockdowns or curfews and strict curfews. It's the responsibility of the citizen and not the policeman to keep you at home and keep you away from loitering. The other things that you can do that essential stopped. So essential services should be continued. 
so that normalcy of life continues. It's also the question of livelihood, not only questions of, of life. You must have a robust healthcare system that should be in place. And the uh, BMC or the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai has done a great job. They've had micro containment zone. So if you see what Mumbai is designed into, Mumbai is actually divided into zones. And call this municipal limits. They've got A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. They've divided in 26 zones. We set up war rooms in each zone. So every patient could call their particular zone war room number and tell them, hey, listen, I've got fever. I've got COVID positive. I've got a report that's positive. And then that zone or that war room actually directs you to the closest hospital or directs you to the hospital of your choice if whatever is available. So in this way, you prevent overcrowding of hospitals you get directed to the correct place and you are rushed into hospital they also send you ambulances they notify you they take notify the hospital so the war room is actually a first point contact from the patient their family and the hospital the other things is hawkers uh, street vendors non-essential services were shut government hospital capacity government offices capacity were reduced from 50 percent to 15 percent so nothing was stopped but the capacity was markedly dropped so i think these are the lessons that the rest of the country can learn they also built huge robust COVID care centers patients they don't only work as hospitals but they are also going to be working as vaccine uh, centers which will help prevent further uh, spread of COVID 19. right Dr. Sandani, one question which I think even the Supreme Court has been asking is on oxygen management, because in many of the other parts of the country, notably Delhi, it's it's really that oxygen crisis. We, beds can't be expanded in Delhi because there's no oxygen. People are dying because we're seeing these ghastly pictures of people just scrambling to get oxygen cylinders. Uh, what? Why is it that, that did an oxygen crisis hit in Maharashtra and in Mumbai to that same extent? And if not, why not? So I must be honest, Rashtra did have some oxygen crisis. Places like uh, uh, Nagpur, for example, which is a bigger city in Maharashtra and internal of Maharashtra did have it. But Mumbai, for God's good grace, did not have a crisis. And I think essentially because Mumbai adequately and Maharashtra adequately produces its own oxygen, that's a great help. And the big centers, the COVID care centers were actually catering to so many new patients and so many patients as a general that there was adequate capacity of oxygen. Secondly, many hospitals in Mumbai and Maharashtra have their own capacity to generate oxygen. So that's one big thing that they did, that they had their own oxygen generation capacity and tankers. So they were not dependent of import of oxygen from other states and other towns from the state. That's how Maharashtra has actually overcome this crisis of oxygen. I also, you know, I've repeatedly told everyone that please do not hoard oxygen cylinders. So one way, if you see Vikram, Maharashtra, India has a capacity to produce about 7,500 metric tons of oxygen. We actually require about five and a half to 6,000 metric tons. So there's actually no dearth of oxygen in terms of supply in terms of manufacturing, but actually the oxygen is not reaching the correct places. And that's essentially because of roadways, transportation, uh, cryo cylinders, which are actually a, a less in number in the country that's causing this problem. Okay, before I come back to Dr. Sachin, one more lesson that I just wanted to ask you. You, Dr. Sandani, dealt with the first wave and now the second wave. People are saying it's a different variant. There's something there's something ugly about it. It, it, it attacks you earlier. Your, you, your cytokine storm doesn't happen after six or seven days. Sometimes the cytokine storm, it's in the third day. Sometimes your breathing problems are second day. And that's why people are getting into trouble. Um, you understand this beast, I think, a little bit better than the rest of us do. What are your learnings from your battles with, with, the, with this new variant? Is it a, a, is it a new variant uh, which is causing a second wave? And what are your specific uh, instructions to any other doctor who has to confront this right now. Uh, Dr. Samdani, I think you may have uh, dropped off. 
we'll try and get you to log off and log in again. Maybe the signal will improve a little bit. Um, Dr. Sadi, let me throw that question to you. Are you noticing anything different about the second variant? Definitely, Vikram. We are noticing something unusual about the second wave. First and foremost is what we are seeing is the population affected. Previously, in the first wave, we used to say it is predominantly the elderly, more than 50 or 60 years that are predominantly affected. But what we are seeing in the second wave is the age group of 20 to 45 years. I have, I think, four or five kids of 18 years currently admitted under me. So it's the younger population who are currently being affected the most. Second, regarding the infectivity of the virus, it has changed. The virus has, I think, probably modified itself regarding its infectivity because previously in the first wave, we used to see a single person or two persons in the family are coming with COVID positive reports. Now we are seeing the entire family is positive and a people like four people had, you know, just sat in different corners. They had their food, they had their lunch. All of them are turning positive. So obviously what we are seeing is a very high infectivity rate. And third is the disease severity. When we see about the virulence of the virus, it has changed. The virulence is more severe. It is attacking the lungs and damaging the lungs more severe as compared to what was being It is slightly sneaking away from the various symptoms. That is, the virus is sneaking away from the upper respiratory symptoms. Many of them are having very mild symptoms like maybe a little nose congestion and all, but their lungs are definitely damaged beyond the mild capillary, what we call it as, in the CT scan. So what it means is the virus is attacking the lungs and damaging the lungs in a more virulent way as compared to what we used to see in the first wave. So definitely what we are seeing is a different strain of the virus. The virus is bringing its new weapons to attack the humanity. It is mutating itself to adjust to the host and sneak away from these tests and uh, diagnostics. Okay, that's that's really, really interesting to know. The virus has been mutating and the new variants are scary. I want to start taking the question now. Adil Hussain has this question. By the way, it's a really, really critical question. I hear this all the time. Any role of inhalers? Is there any role for inhalers in, in uh, curing, controlling COVID patients? I keep hearing about this, by the way. Uh, you know, budocord, budocinine, inhalers. If this is a new, if it's a variant that attacks the lungs earlier, should that be something that people should be using? So inhaled uh, budicort, budicort is basically a budicinoid Vikram. It is a kind of corticosteroid. So inhaled steroids have long been known in the pulmonology field that it has an anti-inflammatory effect. That is, it helps to reduce the inflammation in the lungs to significant extent without causing the systemic side effects of the steroids when we are by IP or by oral route. So it is not a new thing, but the studies have come up in the recent years and the recent months, which say that inhaled budesonide group in the mild category, they had a better recovery time and the amount of the severe disease in those who received inhaled budesonide was less as compared to those in which inhaled budesonide was not given. So but the bottom line is inhaled budesonide or inhaled corticosteroids have an anti-inflammatory effect in the mild diseases and the patients really do well and have been using inhaled steroids even during the first wave because being a pulmonologist we know the physiology and how does the mechanism of steroids work when given by inhaled route. I think many of the other doctors also would agree to this most of the pulmonologists and physicians were using inhaled steroids even during the first wave and we have got a good response with it. Okay. And Gam has this question, Doctor, and many experts are claiming in social media and TV that plasma therapy, remdesivir, doesn't work. Doctors on the ground are prescribing them for treatment, which is reflected in social media where people are asking for donation and help. Uh, Dr. Sandani, let me just throw that to you. Um, what, especially with this variant, what is the treatment? I know people are saying, try plasma, and then you're seeing people tweeting and saying, give me plasma, give me plasma, or remdesivir, and people are saying, We'll pay any amount of money in the black money, market, black market market. market in this way. Do these work or do they not work? So let me tell you, the drugs that are available is, oh, I'll just extend this question, is oral favipirovir, which is an antiviral. And then you have intravenous remdesivir. These are the two antivirals that are available at this moment. Both these drugs are not life-saving drugs. The studies have shown that they've been given approval for emergency use. They shorten the duration of hospitalization. They shorten 
help the length of stay becoming less. Thus, they, and the data is clear that they do not save lives. So they're not a drug that's labeled to be a life-saving drug. However, my contention is that if you have a that Okay, I, I still think we are struggling to get Dr. Sandani's connection straight through. So, Baruna, come back to you again. Uh, Dr. Sandani, you want to add something to that? Plasma therapy, remdesivir, favivir. You've already said that, yes, inhalers do work. These medications which people are really desperate for? So, uh, basically, we have to understand that we have an armamentarium of the drugs. We have a certain group of drugs in our hands. But what I will still suggest is the right drug at the right moment is the need of the R. Because when we come to the medicines from the top, which is the best for COVID, the top rank again goes to the steroids. That is what everybody is knowing. That is based on the recovery trial, which showed that you know, steroids, when used in severe disease, significantly reduce the mortality. That is, it had a survival benefit. So that doesn't mean that steroids should be pumped in, into every patient. The same recovery trial also showed that if steroids are given in mild disease, the mortality rate went. That means you should not prescribe steroids in the mild disease or especially in the first week of the illness in the mild disease. Steroids are to be reserved for those requiring oxygen or who have a severe disease in the lungs. There, in that category of population, they do provide a mortality benefit. That is, they reduce the chance of dying due to COVID-19. The second group of drugs that we come across very commonly is remdesivir. Remdesivir also, if we see the trials, the ACT trials and all which were published in NEJM, it says that remdesivir has a benefit in early recovery only if given to those patients who need oxygen support or those who have significant lung involvement. So remdesivir is not a drug to be prescribed in mild disease patients. So what remdesivir does, being an antiviral drug, it basically reduces the viral replication, decreases the length of hospital stay by approximately four days. That means a person who will be discharged four days later can be discharged four days earlier. That is significant because I still feel that considering the cost of hospitalization and care, reducing the length of hospital stay by four days is significant okay. from the clinical point of view. Coming to the other antiviral which Sir was telling Dr. Pateet, the favipiravir. So favipiravir is an antiviral medicine which is prescribed in mild cases in certain scenarios. So being an antiviral drug, what avipiravir does is basically reduces the length of stay by one to two days only. So still the efficacy of avipiravir is in question because one to two days in a mild disease is not clinically that relevant when compared to an oxygen patient recovering early by four days. So still remdesivir is given the priority in such group of patients. And of course, uh, plasma therapy, when you come to the PLACID trial, be it be the recent trials, be it be the recently published uh, meta-analysis on plasma therapy, most of these are a little disappointing. The plasma therapy is not improving the survival. It is not improving the length of hospital stay, nor any clinical parameters. So the recent trials on plasma therapy are a little disappointing, but still we need to you know, follow up with the plasma therapy before totally disregarding it, because plasma therapy is something not very new. It has been used since okay. ages for a variety of conditions. All right, so don't necessarily go with these drugs. Dr. Sandani, you've got, we, we, we've got you back. Sorry, so yeah. I, I know this, it's, the signal is going coming and back. We'll try and get your thing. I have to ask you one crucial question, right? With, in, before the signal goes again, vaccination. Everyone is, I can't see how many questions I'm getting. People are saying, I've got my first COVID shield dose six weeks ago. Pradeep Kumar says, I'm 17, now tested positive. Should I have another one? But before I come to this entire question of should you have your second dose if you're COVID positive or not, first, how efficacious are vaccines being? You've dealt with so many COVID, COVID uh, patients. Your, your doctors have been dealing with them. Tell us, are vaccines working, Dr. Sandhani? See, it's absolutely mandatory that every eligible citizen in this country gets vaccinated. And this is true globally. Vaccines are here. Vaccine saves lives. Vaccines 
prevent you from a severe infection. Vaccines prevent you from entering a hospital and entering the ICU of the hospital. Vaccines, the efficacy of the vaccine is not to say you will not get COVID. The efficacy is to say the chance of you getting severe COVID infection and mortality reduces significantly. The data here says as high as 80 to 90 percent. I would extend this at this moment to even higher levels. Now, should you get vaccinated? Absolutely, certainly. Which vaccine? Any vaccine that's available is safe. It's effective. The immunogenicity, the response, the safety, the tolerability all have been extendedly studied. And they both at the moment that's available, the COVID shield and co-vaccine are safe. Now, if you had COVID, Vikram, you just asked me, would, should you get vaccinated? The answer is yes, you should get vaccinated. 15 days after you recover from your COVID is the earliest time that one should get vaccinated, whether it's the first shot or the second shot. So if they've already had the first shot, so they got the first shot and then they got COVID, um, everything is energy is asking this, Pradeep Kumar is asking this, they should still get the second shot, but they can wait for a while, if I understand you correctly. You're absolutely right. In a situation where there is a dearth or crisis of vaccine, these people who've got their first shot and have had a recent infection, if it's easy for them, they can do the antibody levels. And if their antibody levels are really, really high, they can delay getting their second shot. But if you don't have the facility of the uh, test or doing an antibody, you don't have the luxury of doing it, you may well take your second shot 15 days after you've recovered it irrespective of how severe you've had the infection. Okay, Dr. Sandani, I'm going to ask you now a leading question because I've been asking this to all top doctors from all the major hospitals around the country. Uh, the number of people there at Breach Candy, it's one of the best known hospitals there. You must be having so many healthcare workers. All of them are dealing with COVID patients in a morning, night, noon and night, they're dealing with COVID patients. Most of them have been second vax, have, have got their vaccination. Any of your workers with high exposure to COVID after they were vaccinated, did any of them end up in an ICU, pass away, or get serious COVID? I will be absolutely abrupt and clear also in saying, and with all honesty, none of my healthcare workers who got two shots have had a severe infection. However, there have been patients who've come to me, there have been patients who've got admitted who had two shots, and let me also unfortunately tell you, have had a second attack of COVID-19. So they've had COVID-19, for example, in March, April, May last year. They've taken their shoe two shots. Well, about a month and a month and a half before they've got the second attack and they've got admitted. None of them have got into the ICU. None of them have got in the ventilator and thus none of them have expired. However, I am struggling with one doctor colleague who is an elderly gentleman who's about 78 who's not practicing actively in terms of seeing COVID patients, has come with two vaccines and at the moment is on the ICU, but he's not on the ventilator and he is recovering from his admission. I'm, that's the, I mean, I'm just saying anecdotally, I'm, I'm, I'm almost surprised that the government isn't taking some of these stories and putting them out there because if Ames has said what you just said, Medanta said the same thing to me, Fortis has said the same thing to me, Breach Candy, now, Dr. Sachin, let me ask you that question in Manipal. Are you aware of any of your colleagues? They're in the highest risk category because they're dealing with COVID patients morning, noon and night. Any of your colleagues who have been fully vaccinated, who got serious COVID or in the ICU or who passed away? So I have got a couple of my doctors and a couple of my nurses who have got COVID despite of full vaccination. But uh, lucky to you know say that you know most of them had mild disease or they were requiring uh, a little oxygen support that is a moderate disease. None of them ended up in ICU. None of them required HFNC or invasive ventilation. So most of them either had a mild or a moderate disease. And one of my doctor uh, who is basically uh, you know, very elderly gentleman, he also had a kind of scarring in the lungs following the, the healing of COVID disease. So we had to start him on anti-fibrotic medicines, but he never required an ICU or a ventilator. So he came out very well from the disease, just on oxygen support. So, Dr. Sandani, the reason I'm dwelling on this point is that when people are still, I'm, I'm almost horrified that there are people still today saying, should I have the vaccine or should I not have the vaccine? 
the answer should be crystal clear. Uh, if, if, if you can get COVID, if COVID is a disease that you get, but you will not go to the ICU and you will not die from it, you'll stop being scared of COVID, right? So the it, it seems to me the answer based on what the two of you have said and what the other evidence seems to show is you get the vaccine, two shots of vaccine, you're fully vaccinated, you're not going to go to the ICU, you're not going to pass away. It's a no-brainer at that point. So absolutely true. You know, I call this group as vaccine skeptics. These people have doubts about the efficacy of the vaccine. And I think they are more doubtful about the safety. It's far beyond proof now that these vaccines are absolutely safe. I urge everyone that you, I don't recommend, but now I urge and I plead and I beg now to say, please go get your vaccine. But Vikram, the vaccine should be given in a proper manner, not in terms from the healthcare side, but the person who's going to take the vaccine should make sure he does a couple of do's and a couple of don'ts before he goes into the vaccine. And we can discuss okay. that when it comes. Okay, great. I'm just going to quickly take some more of the questions that are coming. Ashish Dengre has this question. Either of you take it. I'm in the 29th day of COVID. Uh, medicine stopped yesterday as per doctor's advice. Follow-up blood test should be conducted tomorrow. I got a sudden bout of fever for four hours today, which came and went on its own. I didn't take paracetamol, any possible reason. Now, again, he's not saying whether he was vaccinated or not vaccinated. Um, either of you, you know, is this long COVID? Yeah, Dr. Sandani? While, while we, so uh, we I can go. tell you, there is a percentage of patients who after completing 14 to 15 days, they have this inflammation still going on. And this is not an infective fever. This is an inflammatory fever. Do make sure that you don't have any other infection. Make sure you don't have urinary tract infection, that if you were admitted, if you're not, you don't have an IV line infection, you don't have any other cause of your fever. If you have no other cause of the fever, your fever will settle. This fever can linger for up to three to four weeks after you've recovered. I would not be worried about, I would just be observant and treat you symptomatically. Okay, um, Dr. Sutton, question from Love. Um, is it advisable to get an antibody test done before getting the vaccine? What if I'm COVID positive, asymptomatic, and then go and get the vaccine? Um, so should you be getting antibody tests or RT-PCR antigen tests done, or should you just go and get the vaccine? So none of these tests, nor, neither the rapid antigen, nor the RT-PCR, nor the antibody test, and uh, recently in the media, it is coming about CRP. So neither the CRP are recommended prior to the vaccination because none of these can conclusively rule out COVID. None of these can conclusively prove that you have COVID. So what is more important is if you have any symptoms suggest you of COVID, get yourself tested for COVID. If you are asymptomatic, not came into contact within the last one week with any COVID positive patient, then without any fear or without any doubts in the mind, you can still go and get yourself vaccinated. Okay. Dr. Sandani, a couple of questions coming in on, again, trying to understand the new, is it a in definitely a new variant? Uh, is there anything you've been able to put together, mutant strain, non-mutant strain, how it attacks? We were just hearing from Dr. Sachin about how uh, it, it seems to be behaving in a, in a different manner and in a, attacking the lungs in a more aggressive manner than what was happening in the first phase. Anything you'd like to add to that? I mean, you, you've had the, the, some of the closest experience in tackling the beast. Yes, let me tell you. So if you look at the history of mutation, it actually started way back when, you know, a mutant strain called D614D was diagnosed way back in 2020. And then you have the Danish strain in June. And then you have the UK variant in September 2020 that should have alerted us. We would have probably averted this crisis. And then, of course, you have the newer strains. The Indian strain, which started in Maharashtra, the B.1.617, was the one that was proven to be more infective, but did not have more seriousness. This means that this new strain, or the double mutant strain, or the UK strain, or the Indian strain, now has more risk of infecting others. It said it can infect as much as 8 to 10 times more than the previous non-mutant or the knife strain. And now recently in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, you had the N440K, if I get the number right, which is again proven to have more infectivity, but not more severity. So these strains are going to be there. Let me take you historically back, Vikram, on this show, that 
1990, you had the influenza pandemic. The today's flu, to me, is a mutant virus of that influenza, of that flu virus, which is the same. So this virus is here to stay. It's going to mutate. It's survival of the fittest. And it is going to change its shape, virulence, and of course, the way it attacks people. So mutations are going to be there and mutations will remain for the next 50 to 100 years. And I only wish that I'm wrong. So the, all the mute mutants that we've got show more infectivity, but not more severity. That means we need to take our behavior very seriously. We need to have more covid appropriate behavior to prevent this spread of infection and not be fearful of saying that this is a mutant strain. What I do fear and what I do see in future is what we call as escape mutants. Escape mutants are mutants that, you know, when man gets, the virus gets used to men and humans and humans don't allow these viruses, they again form a new mutant and a new way to enter the human body. And these are called escape mutants. And we've had escape mutants in almost several viral diseases in the past which can turn out to be not only more infective, but probably more virulent and probably more serious. Probably more serious. Uh, Dr. Sadeem, I'm just going to throw that back to you one more time, because again, people are asking about these mutant strains, your own sense of that, because obviously that's the other reason to really vaccinate people on warp speed, because the more people who get this means the virus has that much more chance to replicate. The possibility of mutations goes up and the real Fear, I guess, in everyone's mind is that what if there's a new mutation that comes up that's even more deadly than, than what's happening right now? What happens if something comes up where the fatality is not 1% or 1.5% or 2%, but 7%, 8% as, as happens in some other diseases? Is that is that a threat, you think? Is that a risk, you think? I think it is definitely a threat because mutations when happen, you know, a slight change in the viral structures may not produce a significant change in the virus, but there can be sometimes some antigenic shifts or shifts that can happen. And these can, you know, result in some mutations which will make the virus more virulent. So currently the studies are being uh, on the way to see how virulent are these. That's why we are classifying them into VOCs, that is variants of concern. Why they are variants of concern is because they are possibly known to be more infectious, they're possibly known to be more virulent, they are possibly known to escape the antibody response by natural immune response or by the vaccine-mediated immune response. So I think it is a concern. So we have to keep following up and more data is needed to say that how virulent are these. But what we are seeing right now is a different uh, scenario. Although we don't have an evidence to say that, you know, the virus is more virulent or more infective, we need more data for it. But what we are seeing in the current second wave pandemic is we are seeing the youngsters who are getting more severe disease. The lungs are damaged. They are getting more severe lung disease compared to the first wave. They are requiring very high flow oxygen support and their response to treatment is not as good as we used to see in the first wave. So all of these should, you know, alert us to, you know, get more data and more evidence in order to find out why this is happening, why the virus, is this something due to the double mutant, triple mutant, or the AP mutant, or something else, or the virus itself has changed its virulence due to the changes in the spike protein or its genetic material. So I think this is a continuum, so more data is needed to understand this phenomenon. Okay, Dr. Sandani, Shayan Jain has this question. What about cases of COVID recovered people who are still having cough issues even after five to six months of recovery? Also, can they now be expected to have immunity from the newer strains now? So, first part of the question, Shayan, is if you're still having persistent cough after five to six months, uh, you need to get investigated. Some people, some small percentage of people who've had a viral infection, may it be COVID or any other infection, do get a poor lung function in future. I don't want to throw names. You possibly can get fibrosis or post-infective scarring where you can get persistent cough. This can be managed. You probably need to see your doctor and get a pulmonary function test done and probably a CT or an X-ray as per his or her advice. And this can be managed well. The other part about is whether you've had infection in the past and this mutant virus can again get you infected. Well, 
Uh, immunity, by and large, at this moment, seems to fade away probably in four to six months. So anytime after three months, you need to be more cautious. Needless to say, you need to be cautious from day zero to prevent an infection. Dr. Sandani, just a question related to that. You said that immunity after you get COVID fades away after four to six months. What's to say that the immunity from the vaccination will not also fade away? Is there any, any evidence to show that? Absolutely no evidence. The vaccines have just started. Come 16th of uh, January was the first phase. We're just four months or five months down the line. We don't know how long this immunity is going to last. My gut sense is six to nine months where you will require a second shot or a booster, Vikram. And a flu vaccine is given to everyone every 10 months to one year. So this is a kind of a virus which is similar to the flu virus. You probably will need to get vaccinated repeatedly again. Okay. Uh, Neely Anand has this question for you. I, I think, Dr. Sachin, if you take this, can a TB patient take the vaccine? Uh, also, a recently diagnosed 70-year-old lady on TB medicine, should she be continuing her TB medicine? So, so that's in general... A yeah, in general, Vikram, for a TB patient, especially the pulmonary TB, that is the lung TB patients, what we recommend is at least they should start their treatment for TB for two weeks before start taking any other vaccine. So within that two weeks interval of the medicines, they are not advised to take any other vaccines. So if they are having an active pulmonary cough or tuberculosis, they have to take the treatment for TB for at least two weeks and after that, they can take their vaccine. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sandani, a question from Anupriya Bahadur for you. What are some of the do's and don'ts before and after vaccination? Also, any precaution right after the first dose? Do's and don'ts, I, I, have, a, I have a suspicion. She may be, you know, this question which keeps being asked about whether you can have alcohol before or after or not. Maybe that's what the hidden Vikram, subtext. Miss Anupriya has been... Uh, you know, pinching my back and I've been itching to answer this question and waiting for someone to actually answer this, ask me this question. And this is so, so important. I've actually formulated some do's before you go into a vaccine uh, center. So one, schedule an appointment. And it's very, very important that you just don't walk in to the vaccine center. Please, you will create men. We are now going to vaccinate 18 and 44 and 45 plus and these people may be less symptomatic, asymptomatic. I don't want this whole vaccine process to be a super spreader event. And I keep saying that, please schedule an appointment. Accept any vaccine. Don't go searching for a site or a vaccine center that gives you A vaccine and not B vaccine. We've discussed both are equally efficacious. Unless you have a strong, compelling indication, which has been discussed with your doctor, please accept any vaccine. Both are equal and any vaccine available is good to protect you. Reach the vaccine center on time. Do not go to the vaccine center well before time. You're going to crowd that area. And of course, don't be late. Carry the required papers that you need to go so that you don't waste time. And have minimum conversation with anyone at the vaccine center. Wear a mask. Paramount important. The mask has to be worn properly, fitting tight. Above your nose and below your chin, it should not fall off at any moment from the time you leave your home until you return back. Wear comfortable clothes. The vaccine is typically given on the left upper arm. Make sure you don't wear tight clothes so it's easy for the vaccinator and for the, vac the person who's accepting the vaccine. So you can just roll up your sleeve easily. That's very, very easy. You need to wait there for 30 minutes after you've been given the vaccine so that you don't get untoward side effects. You'll be monitored there. More often than not, this waiting room is not large enough and there could be a large number of people. So my, play, so my request to everyone there is please don't move your mask down. Do not eat your biscuits, water, etc., etc. This is the waiting area. Please don't do that. If you have symptoms of flu, fever or flu-like symptoms or proven COVID or have an exposure to someone in co of co suffering from COVID in the last 14 days, do not reach the vaccine center. You can reschedule your appointment. Some don'ts, do not miss your appointment. Do not remove your mask. This comes as do wear a mask as well as do not remove your mask. That's how important it is. Uh, do not go if you have fever or flu-like symptoms that I've discussed. 
avoid taking the vaccine if you've taken any other vaccine in the preceding 14 days and do not take any other vaccine in the next 14 days. We don't know how this COVID vaccine will react with the other vaccines. And you do not need to pre-medicate yourself. If you've been given paracetamol there, you can carry it home. The chance of you getting fever or pain immediately is so, so, so less that you don't need to be psychologically proven and take that paracetamol just to say that, listen, this arm is hurting. You may get some symptoms. All of us have got some symptoms. Your children, yourself as a child, your grandchildren, if you're a grandparent listening to the show, all have been vaccinated, all have taken vaccines and given vaccines, and they've all had some side effects. So be prepared for it. Okay, that's a really clear list of do's and don'ts. Uh, uh, if I could just come, come, come to, to, to you also, also that's certain, just to, uh, do you agree with everything which was said out there? And also this entire concern about vaccinations becoming a possible super spreader. What do you make of that? Dr. Satin, I'm just asking you that. I think he's got my internet blues now. Yeah, I think he's got your, your, your internet, internet blues, so we'll stay with you. Dr. 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 Samdani, I just want to come back again then. Another question that people are asking about the Mumbai or the, or the Maharashtra lessons, right? Why, to your mind, did Maharashtra become a state which had 60 to 70 percent of India's total cases? And why is it that now the peak has, that it's not rising at that same level of actually active cases are starting to fall? Why? Why did any of this happen? So Maharashtra vis-a-vis uh, Mumbai is, of course, we know the financial capital. You have people coming from all over the country, not only all over the outside people from outside the country. The density of population of Mumbai is so high, probably the highest in the country. There is nothing called a social distancing or physical distancing. I call it physical. Social is an inappropriate term, so it's physical distancing. The lav lifeline of Mumbai is the local train and the BST red buses. Vikram, if one had to go into, there's nothing called as a peak hour today in Mumbai, you would not be away from touching five people in that local train at a given moment time. Left, right, center, back, front, edges. That's how crowded it is. So I think Mumbai became the epicenter, one, because of absolutely lack of physical distancing, and I would say complacency. The Mumbaikers and the Indians have been rather complacent, saying that we won over the first wave, there's nothing like COVID. We've had COVID inappropriate behavior. That's the second C that I say. And the third C to me is that, you know, we've really been at our calm. We've not been alerted and we've not been really protective about ourselves. And that's why Mumbai has been at right at the top. How we averted it, we've discussed the way we've averted it. The government has taken a strong holding to make sure that people don't loiter around and the offices are shut. And that's how we've overted it. And then this is a great model. But yes, the vaccine program should not be a super spreader. We do not want to see a massive third wave. To my mind, we will have a third wave. Maybe somewhere in November, December, and I could be completely wrong, and I wish I'm wrong. But we don't want a massive, massive third wave. Yeah, I mean, right now, I think all of us are just figuring out how to struggle and survive the second wave, and then we worry about the third wave. Uh, Dr. Sachin, the question about how do you prevent... Uh, vaccination centers from becoming a super spreader is a really, really important question. And also the same question, why is it that Karnataka now seems to become be becoming the next major epicenter after Maharashtra? Maharashtra used to be the worst affected state. Now it's looking as if Karnataka may well be stepping up. What to your mind is the reason for that? So the first thing uh, is, as Dr. Samdani said, I totally agree that, you know, the vaccination center should not become super spreaders. So how, to, how can we prevent that is basically, you know, as Dr. Samdhani said, you have to do an appointment. You have to please reach out only via appointment and free walk-ins should be as minimal as possible. Only those who are unable to take online appointments or who cannot schedule an appointment due to technical reasons, only these are the population who have to come by walk-ins. But what is, you know, what we are observing is since walk-in is allowed, majority of the people take it as granted and they just try to overcrowd the vaccine. And the second important thing that we in uh, Manipal Hospital and Karnataka has started now is the mobile vaccination group, wherein a doctor and a nurse will be going in a mobile ambulance and they are helping to vaccinate the people so as to avoid the crowd at the vaccination. 
and second part of the question that is uh, you know what else we can do so that you know karnataka state can reduce becoming an epicenter now so most important is a strict lockdown is the need of the r and as we speak vikram our karnataka government is actually making a decision and making an amendment to impose a strict lockdown in the state and probably this can happen very soon we are expecting this by tonight that a strict lockdown can the decision can come out soon in karnataka so the need of the r is it now a strict lockdown because vaccination will not help in the second wave as dr samdhan is said actually agree the vaccination is to prevent us from the third wave it doesn't help us for the current wave so the current scenario to in order to escalate it really fast i know it's tough to do but i wish we'd ordered a bill to go to the vaccine it is going to be really tough for us and i think one important change that has happened in this is the sputnik v is entered it has already entered india so sputnik v is the third vaccine the advantage i'll tell you for sputnik v i'll not go with the efficacy as dr samdhani said all vaccines are equally efficacious the numbers we should not run behind them although sputnik v is the one of the vaccine having more than 90% efficacy amongst the pfizer and moderna this is the third vaccine so although it has a good efficacy that is not important for us what is important is the interval between the two doses so if you see the interval between the two doses for sputnik v is 21 days that means you can vaccinate a large population in a shorter interval as compared to the covid shield for example where it is 6 to 8 weeks gap we have give after that two weeks it takes for the person to become immune to the virus so i think uh, this can make a some amount of change but still i will say the vaccination is for third wave not for the current wave so currently a strict lockdown is the only uh, need of the r for the state well but dr sandani if i could just sort of play devil's advocate on that i agree i completely agree there may be no choice but to have a lockdown right because if you can't vaccinate people fast enough uh, and you're saving the the vaccination will only save people in time for the third wave there may be no alternative but for the lockdown but one of the problems dr sandani is going to ask you about this when you're doing state wise lockdowns Maharashtra has finished a lockdown. Cases are starting to come down. Delhi finished the lockdown. Cases are starting to come down. Another state has not locked down. How do you prevent people from there to come in here and the entire cycle starts again? That's the difference between state-wise lockdowns and a national lockdown. Doctor Zamdar. Yes. So we come. We know. You know, India is like the second most populous country, and 16% of population is Indian. So I know there will be what you're trying to say is there's going to be a lot of migrancy from one state to another. i think when there is a lockdown in a state by and large people don't travel and even if they travel they do get their covid test of course the covid test has its own drawbacks but no uh, i mean, i'm saying dr samdhani something slightly different what happens if you finish the lockdown maharashtra gets its cases down to a manageable level with three or two weeks three weeks four weeks of lockdown karnataka does the same delhi does the same but there's another state which is not locking down where cases go up then that could precipitate another wave at some point when people from that state start to come here which is why either you then stop interstate movement at that time or you start insisting on rt pcr negative test before people are allowed to enter the state so I the best that's... yes the best thing could be an rt pcr now when you have such large numbers again the you know rt pcr test may not be available in 24 hours as we've seen in the past in maharashtra it's sometimes taken 4 days at that moment an antigen as uh, antigen test the screening test is good you know when we had migrant workers going back in 2020 for states like up and bihar they actually isolated them and quarantined them in shelters at the borders for about 7 to 10 days before they could enter that's one other possibility that will also prevent everyone from doing unnecessary travels so that's okay. the only way you could do Okay, I know we are flat out of time. I'm going to sneak in one more quick question from Bhavna. My father is 59, currently on his sixth day of mild symptom, mild cough, sore throat. After hearing numerous reports of heart attacks after Corona, I want to know what we should do to prevent it. What are the early signs that one could have a stroke or a heart attack after COVID, Doctor Samdhan? So, uh, vascular episodes are known with COVID-19. whether it's a heart attack or a stroke there are known complications i think the one way that you should do is follow up with your doctor and we often do a d dimer test if your d dimer tests are very high you need a more potent antiplatelet or a blood thinner as i may call it for a period of about 2 to 3 weeks 
the largest number of people getting a vascular episode after an acute episode of COVID-19 is within the first four weeks. So if you're protected for the first four weeks and you've studied the risk benefit ratio, I think it's imperative that most serious or moderate to serious COVID patients are on some form of blood thinning medications unless there's a contraindication for at least three to four weeks. Okay, Dr. Sachin, just want to ask you that because I'm seeing these questions that on blood thinners, a lot of people saying, should we just have an eco sprint or an aspirin or something like that if I'm recovering from COVID and had a mild attack? Do you think on the balance of risk, it's not a bad idea to do that? So uh, we practice what we call as evidence-based medicine, Vikram. So we need some evidence for this. So when we look into the evidence, we don't have any evidence to recommend routine blood thinners for everybody having a mild disease. So as Dr. Samdani said, we look into certain parameters like the D-dimer will help us to analyze the risk of this person getting a blood clot in his body. So based on that risk factor and based on his host factors, like if he's diabetic, if they are pregnant, if they are sedentary, that is they are not moving around and the chance of deformation of a clot is higher, then we recommend them some kind of antiplatelet. It could be a milder form like ecosprin, that is aspirin, or it could be a more potent ones like the NOAC, we call them as like epixaban or rivaroxaban tablets. So we do prescribe them for two to four weeks duration because the maximal risk is mainly for two to four weeks following the COVID. And okay. we do have a recommendation for prolonged anticoagulation for severe disease patients. That is, those patients who had a severe COVID-19 after discharge, since these are the patients who are vulnerable for the clot formation, we have a, some evidence to say that we can give them a prolonged anticoagulation for two to four weeks post-discharge with some NOAX in the form of rivaroxaban or apixaban, which we do are practicing currently. All right. Dr. Sachin, Dr. Sandani, thank you so much. It's been really, really illuminating. We've got some fantastic do's and don'ts for vaccination, treatment, what people should be doing, what people should not be doing. And I think the lesson which I've been trying, which in most of the shows we emerged from saying is, for heaven's sake, go and get yourself vaccinated if you haven't yet done so. That's something which you must do. Uh, just to remind all of you, in case uh, you want to see one of the earlier programs of Ask the Doctor, they are all available on the Editor G app. You can download it. Just go to editorg.com slash download and you can see all these full episodes uh, and get all the medical advice. Dr. Sandani, Dr. Sachin, once again, thank you so much for taking the time. All these people who've had these questions and concerns in their mind, I think they'll be, they'll be really, really uh, thankful that they were able to get answers from you. Thank you Welcome. both so much. Thank you so much. Thank Sorry you. for the internet glitches and Dr. Sachin. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye.